a recap of something we did last time. We, the, 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 uh, the barrier method is going to rely on Newton's method uh, kind of heavily. So just a quick recap of Newton's method. There are uh, two versions of Newton's method, if you want. Uh, or it's, it's useful to think about Newton's method uh, in two different ways, either as, a, as an algorithm for uh, root finding. So if you are trying to find a solution to a system of equations, uh, big F here uh, suggests that this is a vector valued function, big F of x equal to 0. That's a system of n equations, n unknowns, uh, typically a nonlinear system of equations. Then Newton's method is that kind of update. Uh, if we have an, uh, a candidate solution, then the next solution we get by subtracting that term, Jacobian inverse uh, f of x. Okay, so that's Newton's method for root finding. And then uh, Newton's method for optimization. You can think about it two ways. You could either think about it as just applying the root finding Newton's method to the first order optimality conditions. So you're trying to find a solution to gradient of f equal to zero. And if you think about it, it's exactly uh, the second update that is at the bottom, uh, the second equation here. You subtract the Hessian inverse times gradient of f at x. An alternative interpretation of Newton's method for optimization is that we are minimizing a quadratic approximation of f. Okay. And of course, uh, both are equivalent. So that's uh, Newton's method. And then uh, this is a little bit informally stated here. Uh, if we have a strongly convex function and both the gradient and the Hessian are Lipschitz, then um, the key property of Newton's method is that we get quadratic convergence. So uh, the iterates converge to the optimal solution or yeah, to, to the optimal solution, the minimizer of f uh, quadratically, and the objective values also converge quadratically to the optimal value. So uh, remember, quadratically means that uh, the difference at each next iterate is less than or equal to some constant times the square at the previous uh, iterate. And of course, this is something important here is this big assumption. This is f if the initial point is sufficiently close to the solution. So it's a, it's a local convergence result. It's local convergence. For global convergence, this is something we discussed last time, for global convergence, we uh, do a little tweak on Newton's method, and that is we used what is called a damp uh, Newton's method. Essentially, in, instead of taking the full Newton step, we do a line search uh, and to choose exactly how much we move along the Newton step, we can do some backtracking with a certain kind of Armijo uh, condition. So that's, uh, that is a summary of what we did last time. Let me keep that summary here since uh, I may may uh, make some reference to that. Uh, and then the last thing that we did, and this was at the very end, we were running out of time, so let me just repeat this real quick. Uh, Newton's method has a straightforward extension to the case when we have uh, linearly constrained problems. Okay, so this kind of extension is completely st straightforward. The one that is not going to be straightforward is the one that we're doing today. This one is completely straightforward. That is, if you have linear equations, if you have linear constraints, ax equal to b, then uh, exactly what we had before, if we think about minimization, unconstrained minimization, this has a completely straightforward extension, namely we, uh, we take, in this case, the Newton step, what, what plays the role of Hessian inverse gradient, is this uh, V, where V can be seen as the first block of variables in this equation here. Um, so let me pause here for a moment because this is something that came up in one of the questions in Piazza. So you can see that system of equations there in two possible ways. You can see it as a solution to a quadratic approximation of f enforcing the constraints. So that, that would be maybe the most uh, intuitive extension. Or you can also see it as root finding Newton's method for this system equations that is at the bottom. Root finding Newton's method for the bottom system of, of equations, which is nothing else than the optimality conditions for the original problem. Okay. Now, someone asked the following question that uh, I, I, I thought it was a, a very good point. Uh, the question that someone asked was, wait a second, if you are trying to use uh, root finding Newton's method here, 
Aren't you missing a y there? Aren't you missing this term here, a transpose y somewhere there? Uh, and the answer is, well, essentially, that term doesn't ma really matter. So um, let me just write down something here. It's this, it turns out that um, if you think about, if we think about what we uh, are doing to compute VW, right? So a little observation here. If we have this system of equations, gradi a Hessian f of x, a transpose a zero, vw equal to negative uh, gradient f of x, and then here is ax minus b. It turns out that this is completely equivalent. If I want to include the term a transpose y, right, that's completely equivalent to uh, gradient f of a, uh, sorry, Hessian f of x, a transpose a zero, v, and let me purposely leave this guy unfinished for a moment. Let's say that I put f of x and a transpose y, a x minus b. So this is completely equivalent to this. If I play around with the equations, all I need to do is adjust this. This is just adding this extra term in the first equation. So if I put w plus y here, these two things are completely equivalent. Okay, so uh, you can think about this as applying Newton's method to this guy with y equal to zero. Okay, uh, or you can also just do this uh, and, oh, sorry, I have a mistake here. This is w minus y, minus y. Or you can compute your Newton step like this and add it to x, y. Okay. So the, the, the key point is that the next iterate is going to be the same in the x, y components. Okay. So it's uh, even though the uh, strictly speaking for the optimality conditions you have this extra term, it doesn't really matter on how you uh, the algorithm, um, the iterates of the algorithm in particular, the x components of the algorithm, uh, how that works out. Uh, and a special case is the special case when uh, the initial point is feasible, when ax is equal to b. Uh, so when this happens, when we start from an initial, po uh, an initial feasible point, then uh, we, we get, we get uh, Hessian here, a transpose a zero, VW, and then we just need to worry about gradient here, zero. Okay, so when you have, um, when you have, when you start from a feasible point, you can essentially ignore the second block. However, in the system of equations, this uh, system, this, this variable here, W, does matter for computing the step uh, V. Okay, so you're going to do something like that in your uh, next homework. So that was uh, Newton's method. Uh, by the way, if you are curious, there is also something that we are going to discuss in more detail later, but uh, this may ring a bell. It turns out that in this particular case, when you start from a feasible point, the solution here to this system of equations turns out to be some kind of like um, least squares-like problem. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a regular least squares, it's a least squares that is uh, a little tweaked by the Hessian matrix. Uh, so it's kind of a, a third interpretation of Newton's method that I'll discuss a little bit later in the class. All right, so that's Newton's method. So what is the barrier method? So the barrier method is, again, I want to uh, reiterate that the, so Newton's method for, New, Newton's method for linearly constrained problems it's, it's completely straightforward. It's, 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 it's almost, or it's a, it's a small step beyond regular Newton's method. Today, we are going to talk about Newton's method for a general uh, convex optimization problem when you have uh, inequalities, okay? So let's consider that problem. We have a um, convex objective, some linear constraints, and some 
convex inequality constraints, hi of x less than or equal to zero. So if you think about it for a moment, uh, if you think about it for a moment, uh, it turns out that when we want to solve that problem, the major headache, the main challenge, the main algorithmic, the main computational challenge is to figure out which ones are the binding and non-binding constraints. Uh, in particular, think about a special case that I'm, I'll discuss from time to time today. So this is a special case. Uh, linear programming. So if we are minimizing, let's say that our f function is c transpose x, it's just a linear function. Let's suppose that we do not have, um, we do not have equality constraints. So let me do away with ax equal to b. And we only have inequality constraints. Suppose that we only have inequality constraints that are uh, dx less than or equal to e. Okay. So suppose that we have that problem. So linear programming, at least this, a linear program in this form, to solve it, the crux of solving the, uh, a linear program like this is to figure out which ones of these constraints are binding. If you can get an oracle to uh, tell you what constraints here are binding, then the game is over, right? Because all you do is solve a system of equations. So that is the the, 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 the crux of the difficulty of dealing with inequalities, right? That you do not know which ones are the binding constraints. And that happens if you think about the, uh, this set C as the set, of, the set defined by inequalities. The binding constraints have to do with what happens at the boundary of that set C. Okay, so if you think about, again, a special case like linear programming, think about this set the set x such that dx is less than or equal to e. So this set is, uh, this is back to uh, maybe day one, right? This is a polyhedron, right? So let me draw in, in purposely in some kind of a simple fashion. Suppose that it's a bounded polyhedron, it's something like this, right? If my objective function, my objective is say like that, so this is the set, right? This is the feasible set. If my objective points like that, the optimal solution would be here. But again, the, the whole difficulty is that there could be many, many uh, vertices in that polytope. And uh, figuring out what is the, the key vertex where the linear objective is minimized, that is the difficulty, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm spending a moment here because that is the crux of the barrier method. The barrier method was this idea uh, that was actually, uh, historically, it was an idea that went back to the 60s. And this is something that from time to time happens in optimization. So there were these two guys that uh, uh, actually kind of sadly did not get as much recognition as maybe they, would, they should have deserved in retrospect. Uh, Fiaco and McCormick, they really were trying to pitch this idea back in the 60s. And back then, people uh, were very excited about uh, active set methods, the simplex method and related algorithms. And they completely dismissed uh, Fiaco and McCormick's uh, approach. They thought that would not work. They decide, people decided, the, the optimization community decided what those guys are suggesting has no chance of working and that was forgotten for many years. And in the, in the 80s, mm -hmm. interior point methods really took off and the idea that I'm about to describe is at the heart of that um, of, of that breakthrough. So what is the idea? Again, this is the set, and the complication of solving the optimization problem is trying to figure out the boundary. Right? The boundary is tricky. If you think about, about a polytope, the boundary has tremendous, potentially a lot of combinatorial difficulty. It, it, uh, if you have only about n inequalities, you could have two to the n uh, vertices. So the combinatorial problem of trying to figure out the, the binding constraints could be overwhelming. So here's the idea of uh, interior point methods. And that idea is formalized with the barrier method. The idea is, since the boundary is so complicated, why don't we stay away from the boundary? Stay away. So think about the problem, the original problem, that can be restated as this problem, right? I haven't done anything here. I just, it's a change of notation. I, uh, 
I reformulate the problem by including an extra term in the objective that is the indicator function of the inequality constraints. Okay, so there's nothing there. But here is the idea, and this is the idea of interior point methods. So instead of, instead of dealing with the indicator function directly, so instead of dealing with C directly, let's replace C with some kind of proxy with an, what is called a barrier function. A barrier function that I purposely will choose that pushes me away from the boundary. So the barrier function is like if I put some uh, magnetic fields on this boundary so that I push po points away from the boundary. I try to repel points from the boundary. And I still try to optimize the same objective, f of x. Right? So um, that is the idea. Okay? Now, we want to do two things. We want, on the one hand, to avoid the boundary of c. But on the other hand, we also want to replace this problem with a problem that is uh, amenable to Newton's method. So the barrier, the barrier function, what we are going to use as a proxy for the indicator of C, we would like it to be a nice smooth function that we can apply Newton's method to. So here is uh, this guy, is the main uh, character of today's play. Uh, that is called the logarithmic barrier function. So the logarithmic barrier function, let me put back here um, what C is. So C is defined via these uh, functions, right? H, the inequalities. Uh, I'm so used to a different zooming so here. This is uh, C, right? This is the set C. So the logarithmic barrier function uh, for that set, again, assuming that we have those functions H, the logarithmic barrier function is that uh, function. So uh, it is essentially, uh, a, a generalization of a certain type of function that I mentioned last time. Uh, I mentioned a self-concordant function for the non-negative orthon. This is, this is closely related. Instead of the non-negative orthon, we are looking at this set C. Okay, that set. So observe that, observe that uh, that barrier function is defined. Uh, the domain, first of all, is wherever all the um, functions h are negative, right? Because we are taking log of negative of h. So, so the, the domain is uh, that set that under, I guess, any kind of reasonable assumption is easy to see. It's the interior of this uh, feasible set. So it's the interior of C, uh, which we are going to assume is non-empty. So, uh, and uh, the idea of uh, the barrier method is that we approximate the original problem with this. So we replace the indicator function with uh, this barrier function. Oh, one more thing I forgot to say about the, uh, the barrier function, maybe the most important thing. The barrier function has that domain, and if we approach the boundary of C, okay, if we approach the boundary of C, that means we approach one of the values of hi approaches zero. If we approach the boundary of C, we are taking log, the barrier function will blow up. Okay? So if you think about, I'm gonna draw a picture that is, it's, it's a little bit difficult to draw a barrier function for a two-dimensional picture, so let me draw it for a one-dimensional set. So this is almost a, a trivial picture, but suppose that my set C is something like this. Suppose that C, oh, Suppose that C is, uh, say, this set. So if this is uh, C, then the uh, a barrier function, so if C is, say, 0 infinity, oh, 0 infinity open, right? The barrier function will be minus log of x. So the indicator function would be the following. Since I already showed red, let me, show, let me put red here. So this would be the, the indicator function. Right? So this would be the indicator function IC. The barrier function would be a more, first of all, a nice smooth function, log of x, and it would be something like this. It will blow up as we approach the boundary of C, and then it actually goes to minus infinity as we um, keep going. So that would be the barrier. 
phi. So this is phi of x. A more interesting picture is the following. So suppose that we have a uh, so more interesting picture. Suppose that we have uh, c is the, the interval from 0 to 1. Suppose that this is c. Then the indicator function would be this red curve, right? That would be ic. And then the barrier, the barrier in this case, the barrier would be uh, minus log of x minus log of 1 minus x. The barrier will have this kind of shape. Okay, so it blows up again as we approach the boundary of the set, and the domain is the interior of the set. So then the key idea of uh, uh, the barrier method is that we replace this guy, ic, the indicator function, we replace it with this term, the barrier function. Okay? And then we, we use some kind of tuning parameter here, 1 over t, where t is a positive number. So if t is uh, very small, right, very close to 0, then if you think about these two objectives here, uh, this term will dominate. So the barrier will dominate. That is like if we, if we really have very strong forces repelling us away from the boundary of c. And then as t gets larger, we put less weight here. It's like if that force is weaker, and then we give more weight to um, the actual objective function f. So of course, this problem, uh, sometimes we are, for the rest of the class, we're actually going to recast it as the expression on the right is completely equivalent. So instead of putting f of x plus 1 over t phi, let's write the, uh, just multiply by t. So put mean t f of x plus phi, all right? So that is all we are going to talk about today. We are using that to solve this problem, OK? That is the central idea. So of course, there are going to be some bells and whistles, but that is the gist of what we are talking about today. Uh, yes? Uh, don't assume that h constraints to So you could decide that uh, you're going to define phi to be plus infinity out outside. So yes, in, in, I guess implicitly, implicitly, we are, if anything, we are actually enforcing a more stringent set of constraints. We are not only restricted to being C, but in the interior of C. So the answer, the answer to your question is sure, yes. We, we are going to enforce that constraint. Now, we can assume here, by construction, we, we can assume that that's built into phi. That turns out, it turns out that that's not going to be a major issue. Uh, you know, that we, OK, it would be an issue that I, I can deal with at the end if, if it really, uh, if it really uh, were to matter. But for now, assume that we are going to enforce that constraint. That we are not, not just in C, but in the interior of C. OK? All right. Um, so yes, that's, um, that's, that's going to be the barrier method. So this is the plan. We are going to talk about something called the central path. Uh, the central path essentially is going to be related to the collection of solutions to this problem. And uh, in some way, the central path uh, encapsulates how is it that we can uh, solve this problem by cleverly using this kind of approximation. Okay, that's, so that's the central path. Uh, and then we want that intuition, that idea of uh, approximating one problem to the with the other. We want to actually translate that into an, uh, a real algorithm. So that's the barrier method. Uh, properly speaking. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about convergence analysis. If we have time, I'll present at the, at the end some kind of uh, uh, more formal version of the barrier method that gives uh, the, I guess, a, a rigorous convergence analysis. If we don't have time, then I'll show you just a hand wavy type of convergence analysis. And then feasibility methods have to do with the question that uh, was just asked. Uh, in some way, we have to worry about ensuring that we are indeed inside C. So uh, that's, that turns out to be a relatively minor issue that we'll deal with at the end. OK, so what is, uh, oh, one little thing about um, um, calculus. So here is the logarithmic barrier function, right? That function. So uh, we, the constraints that we want to enforce, right? H 
less than or equal to zero, for each one of them, we replace each one of them with a log term, log of minus h, and then add up all of that and put negative in front. So if you do a little bit of a, a calculus here, right? This is like, I don't know, uh, sophomore or freshman calculus, right? A vector calculus. You, then you get that the gradient of phi is, uh, it has this expression in terms of the gradient of the h functions, OK? And this just follows from using the, uh, the chain rule, right? So uh, each log, the derivative is 1 over h. But then we have to multiply by the uh, inner derivative. So that's where the Hessians here uh, come up. So that's the, the uh, gradient of phi. And then the Hessian of phi is this guy. So let me write down one example. This is going to be important because this is an example that we'll see a good number of times. So I'm going to uh, write in detail a barrier function that we will use uh, from time to time. So if we look at this barrier function, this phi of x equal to minus sum of log of x i. Okay, so this is as if the inequalities in our problem were as if, if the, so this corresponds to this uh, corresponds to h i of x equal to minus x i. Okay? So that would be as if we had uh, all inequalities x i greater than or equal to zero. So if we have that, observe that uh, the gradient of phi, okay, the gradient of phi, if you think about um, this here, you can write all of that. Uh, the gradient of phi turns out to be, in that case, in this case, h i has a very peculiar form. So 1 over h i is just 1 over x i. And the gradient of h i is the vector 0, 0, 0, 1 in the i-th component, 0 everywhere else. So if you do the calculation, you get that this is uh, negative 1 over x1, 1 over xn, which is very customary to write as x inverse 1. Okay, so x, big X inverse is, uh, is kind of standard notation in interior point methods to indicate, so x is standard notation for the diagonal of x, OK? And it turns out that if you play with the Hessian, right? So the Hessian will be 1 over h i squared times this uh, Hessian times Hessian. The rest actually um, disappears in this case. And we get that the uh, Hessian, right, it is 1 over x1 squared, 1 over xn squared, which is x squared, uh, I guess just x squared. Okay. So those are some formulas that will come up from time to time. This is a very, very particular type uh, case of um, a logarithmic barrier function. Uh, oh, sorry, too big, right? So there. Is that better? OK. All right, so that's that. Uh, so what is the central path again? The central path is. Uh, remember, this is the, the uh, barrier problem that we are using to approximate our original problem. So it turns out that under, um, under suitable conditions, uh, essentially if the problem is well behaved, if it is bounded and it has uh, interiors, and, and the set C has interior, under suitable conditions, this problem has a solution. And this is not that hard to see because uh, think about it, right? The term phi forces me to be away from the boundary, right? Uh, and the term f is the objective function that I want to, uh, that I want to optimize. Uh, other than that, I have just some linear constraints. So uh, under fairly mild assumptions, that problem has a solution. So that we call that solution x star t uh, to highlight the dependence on t, x star t. So the central path is this set of solutions, x star t for t uh, positive. Uh, so let me go back to the picture that I had earlier. So if you think about this case, right, this case, linear programming, 
here. Uh, the central path looks something like this. So let me repeat that here. Just for so if we have, so again, we had a picture that was something like this. Let's say that C was like that. This would be my optimal solution, X star. The central path is something that will be here, and it kind of travels like that. So this would be the central path. So the central path is that collection of uh, points. Now, what is your intuition about when T, when T is big and small, where should we be in terms of this central path? When t is big and small, that would correspond to these two endpoints. So this initial point would correspond to t big or small. This would correspond to uh, essentially giving no way to the objective function and just letting the force that pushes me away from the boundary act, and then they will force me to be in the middle of the set. So, that's, uh, so this would be for t zero. And as t tends to infinity, the, the way that we give to the objective function, the actual objective function is much bigger, so we approach uh, the optimal solution. It turns out that, uh, again, uh, under appropriate assumptions, that set, the set of solutions, is actually a nice uh, smooth path in Rn, and uh, we converge to x. Uh, so that's the central path. Now, there is a little bit more about the central path that we can say. So uh, the central path is the solution to this problem, right? So let me put the problem back here. Let's see if I manage to keep my slides in order here. Yes, so the central path is the, the central path is the set of solutions to this problem, okay? So think about the KKT conditions. F and phi are nice, smooth functions, right? Provided that the, the functions defining my original problem were nice, smooth functions. So if you look at the KKT conditions for this problem, what are the KKT conditions? It would be that the gradient of the objective, right? plus some combination of the gradient of the constraints, b equal to zero. So if you look at the gradient of the objective, that is the first two terms here in the first equation. So the gradient of the objective plus some combination of the gradient of the constraints should be equal to zero. So there we are using, uh, that first equation follows from the expression that we had for the gradient of, a, of phi, okay? So we are just taking the first two terms that are the gradient of this uh, objective. And then that plus some combination of the green of the constraints should be equal to zero. Okay. And of course, we have to stay feasible. So AX should be equal to B. And we have to stay feasible. So in particular, the HIs has, have to be uh, negative. They have to be in the domain of, we, X has to be in the domain of phi. So that's the KKT conditions for the barrier problem, the first um, two uh, sets of conditions. And if you look at the original problem, right? So let me put back the original problem for a moment. The original problem is here, right? The original problem is here. So remember the KKT conditions for this original problem are we have uh, something somewhat similar to what we had before. We had combination of the, obje the gradient of the objective, some combination of the gradient of, the, of both the equality as well as the inequality constraints, right? We have to stay feasible, but then there is something peculiar when we have inequality constraints that the multipliers for the inequality constraints should be non-negative and they should be complementary to uh, the constraints, okay? So we should have this kind of complementarity. So we should have this less than or equal to zero, that greater than or equal to zero, and each component, they should be, um, complementary. 
This is the difficulty that I alluded to at the beginning of class, right? The, the, the difficulty of solving a problem with inequalities, with inequalities, is that generally it's extremely difficult to sort out what the uh, binding constraints are. That is the problem. So that's the KKT conditions. So it turns out that the sets of conditions, the two sets of conditions are nicely related to each other. So let me explain how, because this is kind of a neat uh, little observation, and we will we'll actually develop this a little bit further in the, in the uh, lectures to come. So let me do a little observation here. The KKT conditions for the barrier problem, okay, that those, those are the KKT conditions that, uh, conditions that I have at the beginning. Let me rewrite them a little bit differently. Let me rewrite them as follows. Uh, put, uh, put ui, let's say ui of t, put ui of t equal to, uh, I, want to make the, I'm, I want to make the two sets of conditions look kind of alike. So I'm going to divide by t there so that I get gradient and gradient of f. And whatever is multiplying gradient of h, I'll call that u. So let me put ui of t negative 1 over t uh, h i x star t. OK, so let me, let me call this, this variable. So then we can rewrite them as follows. Gradient f x star t, right? Because I divided by t. And then I have defined u like this. So then I get some u i t, right? Gradient h i x star t, i equal 1 to m. And then uh, the rest, uh, let me call, let me replace w over t. Let me call that uh, v, you know, just call it v. So that's fine. OK? So if you want, put that, and v is 1 over t w. So we can rewrite the KKT conditions for the, for the uh, barrier problem that way. Right? That with uh, a x star t equal to b. And uh, if you want to, we can rewrite this as u i t h i x star t equal to minus 1 over t. Okay. And of course, h i x star t is less than 0. So observe, observe that and compare that to this, OK? So the first equation looks almost identical, right? The first equation is essentially identical to this. The second equation looks very similar, right? We, we have, again, ax star equal to b. So check uh, hi x star less than 0, right? instead of h i x star less than or equal to 0. Maybe I should add something else here. We have that, and we also have u i t greater than 0, right? Because u i is 1 over t that. So if you think about it, observe that the KKT conditions for the barrier problem are essentially a tweaked version of the KKT conditions for the original problem. And in some way, uh, they have been tweaked so that we precisely, we sort of uh, did a trade-off. We traded off this condition that is a combinatorial condition about binding and non-binding constraints. We traded that off for this condition. Okay. So let me do one more thing that is kind of cool before we describe an algorithm. So let me do one more thing that is, uh, I find to be pretty cool, and that is... Um, here, it turns out that we can actually get some kind of duality gap. It would be more precise to call this a suboptimality gap. Uh, it turns out the punchline is what I have here at, this, at the bottom of this slide. It turns out that if you solve the barrier problem, if you solve the barrier problem, 
if you look at uh, what we have called uh, x star t, if you solve the barrier problem, we can bound how far we are from the optimal solution, from the op optimal value. We can, we can bound how far we are in terms of t. It turns out that f x star t minus f star, that's less than or equal to m over t. Okay. Uh, so let me show you how that uh, works because it's kind of like a, a neat, um, a neat fact. So here we have um, so let's see we have we have these two equations, right? The um, these two inequalities. This follows from convexity, right? Those two inequalities follow from convexity, and we have. Uh, the conditions there, which are the same as what we have here, the KKT conditions for the two problems. Right. So it turns out that if we just play with uh, those inequalities and these two conditions, uh, we get the inequality. So let me do that, and then we'll take a break after that. So let me um, show you how that follows, because it's kind of a cute little manipulation. So I'll take, I'll take uh, the first, uh, you know, if you think about what I want to do here, I already have that in my first inequality, right? But then I have that mess in the right that I need to turn into m over t. So how am I going to do that? Uh, how am I going to do that? So here is the, here is the, um, here is the deal. So here is the duality gap. So we have those two inequalities, right? So if we take f x star t and subtract f x star, and then now I'm going to combine that with uh, the second set of inequalities. There are m of them. So what I'm going to do is multiply each one of the second set of inequalities by uh, what I called just a moment ago, what I called ui of t. So let me add now ui of t times hix t minus hix star, right? So I, I'm just taking a combination of the first inequality and all the m, other m inequalities. So if I add that, this is going to be less than or equal to, I'm going to do the same combination on the right-hand side, right? So on the right-hand side, I get the product of uh, gradient f x star t plus the sum of u i t gradient of h i x star t. x uh, star t minus x star. All right. Now, what is the right-hand side equal to? What is the right-hand side equal to? So I know that uh, the combination here, right? This combination, this combination is A transpose B, right? A transpose B. So this guy here is minus A transpose B. So what happens when I multiply by this difference? What answer do I get? There was a colleague in statistics, Catherine uh, Ryder, who said, whenever a professor asks that, the question is zero or one. Right? Whenever the professor asks in a class, what is the answer to this? It's always zero or one. So uh, when you multiply this, what do you get? Zero, that's the correct answer, okay? Why is that? Because both x star t and x star are feasible, right? So they both satisfy ax equal to b. Uh, so both of these guys, so this is equal to zero because we have uh, both of these uh, constraints, right? I, I guess, I guess here, see? This guy is equal to b, and that guy is also equal to b. So if you take a transpose v times that, you get zero. And then we're done, basically, because then we conclude, we conclude that f of x star t minus f of x star, let me move everything to the right, so then I get u i h i x i, right? Negative. Right? Now each one of these products is 
uh, negative 1 over t. So I get, I guess, less than or equal. m over t, that's this guy here, plus the sum of u i t h i x star t. Okay, and all of these guys are negative. Okay, h i x star. Oh, sorry, not, 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 not t, just x star. All of these guys are less than or equal to 0. So then we get that this is less than or equal to m over t. Okay? So it's kind of a neat, uh, this is a neat property of the uh, barrier problem that if you just think in terms of the KKT conditions for both the barrier problem and the original problem and play with them, that also automatically gives you this kind of uh, suboptimality gap. Uh, I, I, I name this duality gap because actually uh, we will see a little bit later in the course. You can also see this from duality. It, it's actually related to a certain a dual, uh, a, a, a feasible solution for the dual. So you can relate it to duality, but it's, it has a very straightforward de derivation as you can see in terms of the primal problem. Uh, so this is going to be a useful stopping criterion. Uh, so why don't we take a break here, very quick, five minutes. The I call this version zero of the barrier method, okay? Version zero is, uh, well, since we have, so let's see, yeah. Since we have this nice uh, type of duality gap, right? If you want to, oh, by the way, there's a typo here. I, I, this, I guess I, pro, I think I corrected it here and in the version that is posted now, but when I printed this, it was wrong. So this is M over T. So since we have this uh, bound, right, this suggests that if we are using the barrier problem to approximate the original problem, then if we want, say, a certain tolerance epsilon, why don't we pick t accordingly to ensure that the solution to the barrier problem is within epsilon of the original problem? So that is version zero. So version zero would be pick t equal to m over epsilon, right? And then solve that barrier problem uh, for that t. So, and solve it, for example, using uh, Newton's method, okay? Newton's method with the proper line search and so on. Uh, so that is a sensible idea. Uh, that may be like a, a natural first uh, uh, idea, but that's actually not a good thing. It doesn't really work well. Uh, because typically, if you want this to be, so if, you know, if this one, this gap to be small, epsilon, m, you know, for a decent problem, you have a good number of constraints. So t will be a multiple of 1 over epsilon. You need to take that combination of an objective with a constant in front that is uh, proportional to 1 over epsilon and another barrier, and, and then you're solving that problem head on. Uh, in some way, you are... What you, if you were to say, interpret this in terms of the central path, right? You are aiming for a point that is way, way close to the end of the central path directly, okay? Uh, that would create all sorts of numerical difficulties uh, and it would typically be a very slow, um, costly uh, problem. So that generally does not work well. Uh, a better approach, a more effective approach, is to generate points along the central path. So uh, a better approach is to essentially trace points along the central path towards the optimal solution. Very much in the spirit of uh, like when you have a tuning parameter in certain models for um, some statistical models, right? Uh, like if you look at Lasso, uh, as you as you uh, tune your, the weight that you have on your uh, extra term, the term, the regularization term, uh, you, uh, you trace a whole set of solutions. So this is something that is very much in the same spirit here. Think about T as some kind of tuning parameter that is uh, allowing you to trace the central path. So that's, that is a much better approach is to generate points along the central path, so along the path of solutions. So that is the barrier method version one. So the barrier me method version one is the following. We start with some initial t that is not too big, t zero, bigger than zero, and then 
that would be some initial point on our central path. Then we pick a bigger, so we, we solve the initial problem. That would be x0. That would be a solution to the, to the barrier problem for t equal to t0. And then, as long as our suboptimality gap is bigger than epsilon, we do the following. We increase the value of t. And then we solve the new problem, but we use as warm start the previous solution. And that's key. Uh, we, we trace the central path, but then we use as a warm start for each subproblem the previous solution. The idea of this is that if you pick t k plus 1 a little bigger than tk, this previous iterate already gives you a good approximation for the new problem. And then Newton's method is going to efficiently find the new um, solution. And I realize there is a typo in my slides here. This should be, of course, uh, k plus 1. Right? This should be k plus 1. So sorry about that. This should be k plus 1. Uh, so that's, that's the barrier method version 1. Uh, and uh, in the homework, we ask you to essentially implement this and play with it. It actually uh, you know, works reasonably well. A very common update is to increase always by some factor mu bigger than 1. Okay? Now, there is a certain terminology here. The, um, so, let's see. Yeah, here. So first of all, remember this is, sorry, Maybe could correct this typo here. This is x k plus 1. Okay. Now this step and this step, these are called centering steps. Okay. So the centering steps are when we solve the barrier problem. Uh, and the, idea, the, the reason that they're called centering steps is that we are um, aiming for the central path. Uh, yeah, that is, those are the centering steps. So, so that's the common update. And uh, I guess a couple of considerations about uh, how we will go about implementing this method. So naturally, there are two, um, two parameters to make a call here to, uh, to decide. And one is the, of them is the initial value of t. Right? And the other one is how much we decrease t each time. So the initial value of t and the factor by which we decrease uh, t. So mu is that factor, right? So if mu is small, then that means that we are shy about how we are decreasing t. So if, if, if mu is small, we will have to do this loop many times. On the other hand, if mu is too big and we are too aggressive on how we decrease t, then the warm start that we get for the next point is not going to be as useful. So there is a little bit of a trade-off there. Uh, the smaller mu, the more useful the, the, the warm start, but the slower. The bigger mu, the faster in terms of iterations here. But then the more costly, the more uh, work we would do to in the centering step. So that's, that's, a, that's something that concerns mu. And then the initial value t uh, again, it has some kind of similar uh, consideration. If we start with t that is uh, too small, right? If t is too small, what that means is that in the barrier problem, we're going to give less weight to the objective. It's all about essentially being in the interior of the uh, feasible set. So that probably would be easier, but then we need to work our way. Uh, we need more steps here before the objective starts kicking in and we actually approximate, approximate the optimal solution. On the other hand, if we pick t too big, then in the extreme, if we pick it so big, we would be back in version 0 that I mentioned in a couple of slides ago. That uh, would then make the subproblem, the barrier problem, take too many iterations. Okay, the centering step, the first centering step will take too many iterations. So, uh, something that is kind of a, an interesting fact of life, and this is a distinction between, uh, this is kind of a key distinction that I have observed between second order methods and first order methods. So th there is a certain, um, say, theory, and then there is a certain way that algorithms behave in practice. 
Uh, and the gap between theory and practice, that gap is especially big for second order methods. It's, uh, it turns out that even though these things seem like they would be really critical considerations, in the end, when people go and uh, implement things, the implementations miraculously turn out to be well behaved. That may be a testimony that we still have more to learn about how, uh, how we should analyze second order methods. Maybe, maybe we haven't quite fully understood them. Under, yeah, we haven't understood them fully. So, uh, you know, maybe some of you guys are going to figure that out. So, uh, so the, the key point here is that empirically, it looks like the, uh, the choice of mu and t0, even though in, in principle would be quite critical, there is a certain degree of robustness on them. Uh, so here's a couple of pictures that are taken from Boyd's uh, book, that just verbatim. Uh, this is for applying the barrier method to a small uh, linear program. So it's basically a, a kind of example that I have shown here. So you have 50 variables and 100 inequality constraints. And then this is what happens in terms, if you look at the, on the y-axis, you have the duality gap. On, on the x-axis, you look at the total number of Newton uh, iterations. So if you take mu small, if you take mu small, you can see how uh, essentially the kinks here correspond to the outer iterations. The kinks are the number of times that you have decreased t. Uh, so the kinks, of course, are much smaller here than if we pick bigger mu. If we pick mu, bigger mu, then each time we reduce t by a lot, so we make a lot of progress. But each time, if we take mu more aggressive, then it takes more Newton iterations to, in the centering step. If we take mu small, uh, we don't need as many Newton uh, iterations per centering step. But if we take mu too small, the number of outer steps somehow ends up costing us more than uh, what the centering steps uh, uh, compensate. So if mu, if mu is shy, it turns out that we actually need a little bit more work than if we take more aggressive mu. So that's, uh, again, the behavior of the barrier method for some, um, some small linear programs. So that's the first version of the barrier method. Okay. Uh, now, if you, if you look again at the statement that we had before, the duality gap, right? If you look at the duality gap, and you, so m over t, right? If you look at that and where to apply the barrier method exactly as it's written there, then it's, this theorem is completely straightforward. Uh, tk, tk would be this denominator here, right? Mu to the k, t0. And then by putting those two together, you see that the, after k outer uh, iterations, the barrier method will give you that type of convergence. Okay, so uh, if we try to put it in terms of, say, accuracy, if we want to get the objective to be within epsilon of the optimal value, essentially is something that behaves like log of one over epsilon, log of one over epsilon. So a little pop quiz question now for you. The answer is not going to be zero or one this time. Uh, if we have linear convergence, linear convergence, uh, what is the dependence on epsilon? How many iterations, module, some extra constants for linear convergence? Log one over epsilon. So this is linear convergence, okay? If it is quadratic convergence, what's the dependence on epsilon? It's log log one over epsilon, okay? So log quadratic is exponentially faster than uh, linear. Right? Quadratic is really uh, lightning speed. Interior point methods are not quite there, and, the, and this is kind of a, even though Newton's method is quadratic, because we have to use the central path and trace the central path, the quadratic convergence of Newton's method degrades to linear. But, but we are solving a pretty difficult problem, right? We are solving, in principle, the full uh, problem with inequalities and everything. So not a bad thing. Uh, so that's the uh, kind of linear convergence for uh, the barrier method. All right, so let me say a little bit more. Here is, again, barrier method version one. Okay. Uh, now, if you think about it, there is something about this barrier method that, well, we solve the barrier problem, that's this guy, to get the initial iterate. 
then each time we update t, we resolve this to get the new iterate. And in principle, in principle, these two steps are, what it says there is solve the barrier problem, okay? That's what it says there, solve. Uh, which would mean, in principle, would mean that you are trying to generate points that are exactly on the central path. Now, the central path, however, if, you, if, if your goal is to solve the optimization problem, the central path is not, it's, it's a means to an end, right? The central path is supposed to, uh, it's, it's a construction that is it's kind of like a, an, uh, an auxiliary term that allows us to travel toward, towards the optimal solution. Our goal is not to be on the central path, but eventually to make it to the optimal solution. So the central path is, sometimes it's called a means to an end, not an end on itself. So there is no need to solve each problem exactly if our goal is to solve the original problem. So here is what I call version two of the barrier method. So version two is actually closer to what you would implement because you, would not, you wouldn't, wouldn't really solve this problem, right? You would solve it approximately. Uh, so you solve the barrier problem for an initial value of t0 to get an approximate solution uh, to, the, to that barrier problem. And then you increase t and you solve again using as a warm start the previous point to get an approximate solution. So there are two issues here uh, that can be formalized and I, it looks like I may have time to flash a couple of slides at the end where I give you a formal statement about these two issues. So uh, how close should each approximation be? Okay, how close? You know, what, what would it mean to be sufficiently close here? Okay, what would this mean? And when we solve the uh, barrier problem, if we want to have some formal statement of convergence for the barrier method, we would like to bound how many Newton steps suffice at each centering step. So we would like to uh, account for that. So, uh, Again, it looks like I may have time in, uh, uh, towards the end to give you a formal statement of this. To, to, to answer both of these questions formally, it requires a little more, um, how should I say, um, you know, technical elements. So we'll get to that at the end of the class. But let me show you a couple of things that are uh, kind of reassuring here. So uh, again, if we look at a, say, a barrier method for a linear program, and here we play with the number of constraints. Okay. We play with the number of constraints. Then two things are uh, noteworthy here. The convergence still is sort of like linear convergence. Uh, and the, uh, the number of Newton iterations, the number of Newton iterations uh, essentially scales logarithmically with M, okay? Something of that sort. So, you know, that's a behavior of the uh, barrier method. So, another way of seeing this is to see how many uh, Newton steps we require to reduce the initial duality gap by a certain factor. And it turns out that uh, this is, in, to, to some extent, a sort of a strange, unresolved puzzle of uh, interior point methods. Uh, if you look at the dimension problem here, M, it turns out that something a little bit, uh, this is related to what I said earlier of some gap between theory and uh, practice. Empirically, this is kind of uh, among optimizers. Uh, typically, we, we accept the fact that, you know, something from the order of 20 to 30, uh, 20 to 30 iterations, interior point iterations would suffice to solve a problem, okay. almost regardless of the dimension of the problem. So it turns out that something of the order of, you know, 20 to 30 Newton steps 
suffice to reduce the gap by, say, a factor to, of 10 to the minus, of 10 to the 4. Okay, so it is, uh, uh, it's an interesting practical uh, behavior of interior methods, of the barrier method in particular, and the same thing will happen to the other kinds of methods we will see later. Uh, so that's the barrier method. Again, this is version one. Version two, which is the one that uh, probably will be closer to something you will implement, uh, you will need to pick some kind of uh, tolerance here for the next assignment that you're going to do. You, know, you probably want to pick this to be sufficiently small, uh, but it doesn't have to be zero. All right, so that's the barrier uh, method. Let me, uh, to, to conclude today, let me mention a couple of things. One has to do with a question that was raised at the very beginning, and that is when we do the, all this business of the barrier problem, right, when we replace our, our um, when we replace our problem with this barrier problem, right, for this value of, uh, for this function phi. And if we think about applying Newton's method to each barrier problem, we are implicitly assuming that we can stay feasible. So we stay, we stay in the interior of that set. We want to ensure that h i of x is less than zero. h i of x is less than zero for all uh, functions i, uh, h. So that problem in itself is not a trivial problem. So how do we get an initial point that, satisfy, that satisfies the inequality constraints uh, strictly? How do we get that? Uh, and we, we, if, we, if we want to apply the barrier method, we need to have feasibility because otherwise all the terms that have to do with the barrier function uh, don't make sense. So we need to have feasible points. So how do we do that? Uh, so there is a kind of, um, this is a certain template, template in optimization. This is like a phase one, phase two type of approach. Phase one, you can think about that as the problem of finding a feasible problem, a feasible point. So to find a feasible point, we set up essentially an, uh, an, another, an additional optimization problem. So it could be, for example, this, we minimize uh, S subject to all of the H functions less than or equal to S, AX equal to B, okay? So uh, we want to find a um, negative solution to this problem. As soon as we find a negative solution, we don't really have to solve the problem to optimality. As soon as we ha find a negative solution, then we have a feasible solution for our barrier problem, okay? And we can apply a barrier method to, to this problem itself because all we have to do is add some slacks here and set the initial value of S sufficiently large. And then we can easily uh, get an initial feasible solution for this auxiliary problem. Okay. Then we can solve it with the um, barrier method. Or we can also do something a little more sophisticated. We can, instead of bounding everything with the same S, we can bound them in terms of uh, different S's. So here is, let me put this back. Here is one way of finding a feasible solution, right? Like this. But we could also disaggregate the S's, right? Have SI for each constraint HI. And then, uh, optimize, instead of minimizing S, minimize the sum of the S's. Okay. Minimize the sum of the S's. Uh, and yes, uh, one thing that I should say is here, I think there is, a, there is a constraint that is redundant. If I want to, yeah, so sorry, I, I made a mistake here. This. Let me, let me cross this out, because I realized that only now. I was kind of copying and pasting. So this should not be here. I just want to, I want to make all the components here, the S components to be, I want to push them to be negative, so uh, I want to minimize that, okay? Yes. So each 
uh, as, as I am working through this problem, each inequality has its own infeasibility variable SI. And the goal is to make those variables SI negatives. So uh, one thing that happens is that if the original problem is, if the original problem is infeasible, then uh, when we try to solve either of these two problems, okay, either this guy or this guy, then if we try to solve this problem and the initial problem has no strictly uh, feasible solutions, we will detect that when we try to solve this. So that's a phase one type of approach for finding a feasible point. Uh, I have a few minutes, so let me indulge myself with one more thing that I added. Uh, I didn't post this version of the slides because I added them a little bit later. But this is, this is kind of just for fun, and uh, this happens because let me, let me pretend that I wear my mathematician hat now. This is a formal description of a barrier method. So the, the barrier method that typically you would implement and that people use is what I have described so far. Uh, but this version that I'm describing in the next two minutes is the formal version of the uh, method. And I misplaced my last uh, page here. So the formal, oh yeah, here. The formal uh, method is as follows. Uh, we can give a more formal, formal statement about the convergence of the barrier method if we use a more um, sophisticated type of definition for a barrier function. So we say that uh, if we have, say, a certain domain D in Rn and a function phi divided in that domain, we call it a self-concordant barrier function. If it satisfies two properties, if it is a self-concordant, this is what we described last time, and if the uh, Newton decrement uh, satisfies that inequality. This, that, so the second inequality there should hold for every value of x in the domain. Okay, so it's, it's the Newton decrement square should be bounded by some constant. So nu is a constant there. Uh, so now, if we want to solve this problem, minimize, say, a linear function over the closure of that domain, we can look at the barrier problem. Okay, so let me keep that guy here. And this is kind of the, the heart of uh, a, formal, a formal analysis of um, the barrier method. If you look at the size of the uh, Newton decrement, for this function, the objective function we have here. So what I have called phi t is this function. This is phi t of x. So the Newton decrement for phi t of x has the following behavior. When we increase t, we, when we increase the, the weight on the objective function, then the Newton decrement has that kind of behavior. The Newton decrement, the norm of the Newton decrement can be uh, bounded like that. So this means that we have this, uh, with a little bit more work, we can prove the following theorem. If the Newton decrement is small, smaller than a constant, let's say 1 over 9, then we can decrease t, we, I'm sorry, we can increase t by up to that factor. And after one iteration of Newton's method, the next iterate, the next iterate, x plus for the new value t plus, again, is going to have small, um, small Newton uh, decrement. So if we use lambda t, if, if we use this condition as our condition of being sufficiently close to the solution, this theorem ensures that if we start with an initial point that is close enough, then the number of Newton steps that are necessary in each centering step is one. Okay. One single Newton step would suffice to trace the central path, okay. which is really a remarkable fact, because then essentially this can be translated into a, an overall uh, bound on the number of Newton steps that essentially is of the order of uh, square root of nu times log of 1 over epsilon. So I have one minute, so let me give you an example of uh, uh, just so that this doesn't, doesn't look 
completely, totally uh, you know, uh, technical. So an example of uh, an example of a self-concordant barrier function is uh, this is not going to be a big surprise because this is someone you have seen before. There. Okay. So this function, it turns out that for this function, lambda of x, if you do the calculations, uh, I'm gonna, since I'm running out of time, I'll just tell you the answer. Lambda of x is n. Uh, there is another example of a self concordant barrier function that probably some of you can guess, and that is log debt. Log debt for the uh, positive definite uh, cone is also a self concordant barrier function. And the uh, parameter of that barrier function is also n. Okay? So if you're solving, say, uh, linear programs, then you can solve them. This is the, 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 one of the uh, most important results about interior point methods. You can solve them in essentially square root of n log 1 over epsilon. All right, so let me stop there. I think that's enough for today.